Hello, and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election cycle is well underway, and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot this year, and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, several new borough presidents, and many new city council members. And that's not all that's on the ballot. A number of incumbents are eligible for and seeking re-election, including the city's public advocate. And there's a very crowded and competitive race for Manhattan district attorney, and still more. Today, we're focused on the position of Manhattan borough president. Party primaries are set for June and the general election in the fall will culminate on November 2nd. This is the first full set of municipal elections that will feature both early voting and the new ranked choice voting system. That applies to only party primaries and special elections and we'll explain that in a separate show. The city election cycle would be of enormous importance under more usual circumstances, but it's unfolding at a time of great crisis for our city raising the stakes of the decisions that you, the voter, will make. The new wave of city leadership will quite clearly make or break the city's recovery from the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its many impacts on health, families, jobs, housing, education, and much, much more. It's also important to note, though, that the city was facing a number of crises even before COVID hit, and some of those have only worsened. So it's an important time of choosing here in New York City, and we're pleased to bring you this series of interviews with candidates running for citywide and borough-wide offices, and there will be debates, including for city council. But these one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you to get to know the candidates better, learn about their backgrounds and platforms, where they stand on key issues, and what their vision is for the future of the city or the borough. We hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make informed decisions when it's time to vote. So as we focus here today on Manhattan Borough President, it's a borough-wide office with several core responsibilities around land use, community boards, capital funding allocations, and more. But also a key role as a planner, an ombuds person, a cheerleader, and a representative of the borough. The Borough President appoints community board members and convenes community board leaders while also acting as a convener in other ways, issuing reports, making other appointments like to the community education councils. And the borough president has a significant bully pulpit, which can be whatever the office holder makes of it. And the borough president has the especially strong voice on the issue of land use matters, even if the opinion is advisory. So let's talk about the role of borough president and much more. Joining me now by Zoom is Lindsay Boylan, a Democratic candidate for Manhattan borough president. Lindsay, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Ben. So give folks a couple minutes on your background before we get to your campaign and your platform for Borough President, um, a little background on you and your resume and, and who you are. Sure. I came to New York right after graduating from college with a hundred bucks in my pocket. I moved nine times in 10 years. I did a little clockwise circle around Manhattan. Uh, and in that time, I spent my career entirely uh, in different aspects of the urban planning field. So my first job out of college was working for a well-known well urban planner, Alexander Garvin. I started as an admin, and then I ended up overseeing a parks master planning process uh, in New York, from New York City, but from Memphis, Tennessee. And that was my first real foray into public space management and you know considerations of how we build a good public realm for people. Uh, I then spent the next almost six years uh, working in public space management, overseeing ultimately operations and business development at Bryant Park, uh, 34th Street Partnership, which is a bid, and also the Chelsea Improvement Company, which uh, has been largely absorbed by the Meatpacking Improvement District. Um, and in that time, I served on Community Board 7, uh, and, then, and then I moved, and uh, I served as a public member on Community Board 5. Uh, after the financial crisis, when I was working uh, in this public space management role, I thought it would be really important for me to understand the dynamics at play uh, in financial markets that were impacting, destroying so many people's lives. So I went to Columbia Business School in the executive program while working full time at Bryant Park and 34th Street Partnership. Uh, after that ended, I, after, after I graduated from business school, 
I worked in municipal finance, which is how we fund infrastructure, uh, you know, for cities and for states and municipalities across this country because we have a tax exempt um, municipal bond market. Uh, I enjoyed that experience, but realized I did not want to be in, in finance, uh, even if it was municipal finance. So I then worked for the state of New York, uh, first at Empire State Development, which is the state's economic development agency, ultimately becoming the chief of staff overseeing that agency. Uh, and then I ultimately worked for, for the state more broadly uh, and, and this governor as secretary for economic development and housing. So I oversaw the portfolio of all job creation for the state. Uh, as well as Department of State uh, that does a lot of our permitting um, and um, licensing work, uh, NISCA, which is the New York State Council on the Arts, uh, and also uh, HCR, Housing and Community Renewal. So I got a real across the board, um, you know, I would say experience managing large scale agencies. Uh, I also got to oversee the state's recovery work in Puerto Rico after Hurricane uh, Maria. That was really meaningful to me, particularly because one of the reasons I went into urban planning originally was because uh, when I was a senior at Wellesley College, Hurricane Katrina happened in New Orleans and all the conversations were about how do we rebuild and how do we rebuild in a more equitable, sustainable and livable way in New Orleans. Of course, we know that's not what has happened, but that question really inspired and continues to inspire my career. And I think it's very much um, at the core of the work of the Manhattan Borough President ahead. I, uh, as an aside, I have a great, supportive husband um, on so many levels. Um, and uh, I have this amazing daughter, uh, Vivian, who is the light of my life, our lives. And we live in Chelsea um, and, and we're happy New Yorkers. So uh, you got a little bit at why you wanna be borough president. Um, if someone comes up to you though and says, uh, okay, you're running for borough president, what, what, why does that matter? Why does, why does who the borough president uh, is why does that matter to the average Manhattanite? I think uh, in this moment of crisis, where we are, as you said, uh, charting the trajectory of New York's future and the type of recovery we have and who we recover for, has everything to dis to do with who we put in the Manhattan Borough President's role. Now, there are lots of naysayers who've been in politics a long time and say, well, the Borough Presidents, um, you know, they don't have as many tools in the toolbox. They don't have as much power. Um, I appreciate that, um, but I think people who are effective managers, um, who are passionate about the work they're doing and for whom they do it, will always find a way to be effective. And weighing in, um, having the, the most significant say on land use and zoning, the, the toolbox of how we make decisions of um, our future and building have a huge impact on what that future looks like, not just for Manhattan, but for the whole of the city, remember this is our central business district. Remember this is in many ways our cultural heart and historic heart. And that influences not just the city of New York, but the state and the broader economic recovery. And um, you need someone in this job who has a background in doing this work, who is passionate about those tools, land use, the built environment, how we make a more livable city and has a, has a deep sense, not only of the possibility um, for recovering in a more equitable, sustainable, and livable way, um, but has a lot of experience in doing that work. And so you're going to have a mayor, whoever that is, whose time is going to be split really in fighting with Albany on issues of tax and budget, mayoral control, all these issues that I'm sure you are talking about in that conversation. You need someone in this job who is going to be the person that shows up, listens, and fights for everything New Yorkers and Manhattanites need um, for recovery and to do it in a much more equitable way. We can't just go back to the way we were doing things. And that's why I think it's these moments of tremendous crisis that are always also the moments of, of the most opportunity. And I have a tremendous amount of hope for the future. And um, the more I talk to New Yorkers and Manhattanites, the more excited I am to do this job. Dig into some of the specifics there on what an equitable recovery in Manhattan looks like. Are there examples of sort of the principles you'd bring to sure. think about planning land use uh, recovery in Manhattan that, that are really key to understanding how you would approach this position? So let's stick with um, what issues of resiliency, which motivated my um, step into urban planning from the beginning and 
Hurricane Sandy, let's look at that front and center. Uh, it, 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 it devastated not only many parts of New York, but lower Manhattan. It called into question how we are going to build a resilient city for whom we prioritize, for whom changes are made to create possibility. And I think utterly up until now, we as leaders have failed. Uh, I think we failed people to um, work across agencies. For instance, um, in lower Manhattan, you can't just have NYCHA operating in one way. You can't just have the Department of Transportation. You can't just have DDC, parks, the mayor's office. All of these groups operate in silos. And that is the biggest mm -hmm. challenge to overcoming the investments we need to make in a resilient city, um, particularly one that is going to have increasing, um, you know, flood tides and, um, um, you know, in, uh, increasing the water table. We have many considerations to have in terms of massive investment we have to make in infrastructure for resilient city, but also who that prioritizes. Um, as someone who's built her career largely in urban planning, um, I know the history of urban planning is one that has been largely, frankly, racist and has prioritized. Uh, white families over all else. Uh, we look at the history of redlining, we look at the history of Levittown and for whom we provided middle-class opportunities. Now let's look at Manhattan. Where are our two waste management treatment sites in Manhattan? They are in upper Manhattan in predominantly low-income communities of color. Uh, and uh, we need to do much better than that. Uh, we need to invest in resiliency projects, broad infrastructure that prioritizes the hardest hit communities. Um, and really, in my view, prioritizes those community, communities for relief funds that we're going to get from the federal government. Uh, and that, if we, if we prioritize and center communities that have been hit the hardest, um, who've always been left out of the planning process, we already begin to change the tide of what recovery looks like. So that's a big idea. But these questions are being considered right now and, and whose voice is being heard is considered right now. For instance, is, for instance with issues of East River Park, um, how we invest in Lower Manhattan, how we return parts of Lower Manhattan um, you know, to the environment and how we make investments um, that, that truly reinforce um, the value we have to really um, place in, in, in climate justice. So there's that. There's also issues of housing, I think, and I know I go along in these answers, so you can come. I, I was actually about to ask about housing, so perfect. Go ahead. Okay, so you know our approach largely to um, quote unquote affordable housing in this city has been to perpetuate displacement and um, severe rent burden at best. And let me explain to you an example of what I mean by that. I think mandatory inclusionary housing is another failure. When you create more luxury housing, I live in West Chelsea. If you, if I showed you the, the, you know, a view from my window, it's entirely empty luxury housing. We don't need to be building more spot, stock in, in the luxury market. We need to be uh, increasing access to affordable, deeply affordable, supportive housing, senior housing, and uh, we have models for this. The last century or so, we spent a lot of money at the federal level and then in turn at the state level in some version of things like Mitchell Lama, in investing originally in NYCHA, in investing in low-income housing tax credits, things that make housing possible. But then they got out of the business and that's not really, uh, they being our government, federal and state, that's really not uh, going to work if we want to deal with inequality. When you um, have mandatory inclusionary housing or you have 421A or you have any of these programs that really incentivize affordable housing development, as a much smaller piece of luxury housing development, for instance, um, you're just baking into the cake more displacement. And uh, we have invested in the money. We have federal funds. We're going to get a huge uh, amount of money coming into New York. You wanna talk about economic recovery? Let's talk about actually creating an opportunity for a middle class to exist in this borough. And I think, um, you know, we hear a lot about wealthy people supposedly leaving Manhattan. Uh, I think the big one of the biggest stories is the emptying out of any sense of middle class in this city. And that should be incredibly damaging because you can't have a city that is built upon purely wealthy people. And frankly, that's really how we've operated. And it, we need to do very different things in terms of investment. And as I mentioned, I oversaw um, the Office of Housing and Community Renewal. Uh, I worked hand in hand as the job secretary, basically, for the state. When we talked to companies, for example, let's go on the business side of things, you know, which might surprise you as a progressive um, that I am, companies do not want to invest in cities where their employees can't have a good quality of life. That's, it's that simple. 
And you can't have a good quality of life in a city where housing is impossible, where um, uh, barriers to really good education are seem insurmountable and are only getting that much worse in this moment. That alone, that perspective, we should be able to move on. And uh, I actually think that this management role, as opposed to the city council, um, is tasked not only with $100 million or so of capital funds that um, can go into investing in our community. Boy, wouldn't that be excited for, exciting for someone who's built a career in urban planning, not only in terms of, as you say, advisory on land use and zoning, but also um, intra-agency, working with whoever I have to, to get the outcomes we need. And I think that's really overlooked as a whole. I think frequently women are overlooked in, in our ability to make connections and um, use soft power and approach the issues that really matter. And I will become, you know, one of the most well-known, if not annoying faces to any of the agencies that I need to bring together in order to get better outcomes for quality of life for people. Where in Manhattan do you think there's room for more housing development if it meets, you know, certain affordability thresholds? Um, there's mm -hmm. obviously a discussion around this um, rezoning in the Soho NoHo area. Please let us know your, your thoughts on that. But are there other places in Manhattan, too, that you think are fairly um, ripe, for lack of a better word, for uh, affordable housing development? Well, I think that um, we need more affordable housing in absolutely every neighborhood and community in Manhattan. Um, but let me um, use the example of Soho NoHo rezoning contemplation to explain why I think we're doing it all wrong. Um, it's not that I don't think more every neighborhood and every community should contribute more to affordable housing, but the idea that we design study areas based upon, um, in essence, significant real estate owners and the hope that they will do our work of building affordable housing in an equitable way, I think is just completely backwards. And I think we see that when we look even at the study area of Soho NoHo, it's largely been designed for the benefit of Edison Properties, a significant property holder in that area, saying, okay, well, well, if we if we design this space, if we design this environment, then you'll take on the responsibility to create affordable housing. And I think it's just completely backwards. I, I have to say, and my team doesn't love it when I do this, but I'm gonna do it anyways, because I think there's a purpose to it. Having worked in state government, having worked with federal government, and having worked to a certain extent before that even in the city, uh, I'm shocked and dismayed in many ways by the influence of big real estate in decision making in this city, and um, and in and and in deciding who gets elected and who gets reelected, and I think this is a unique moment to disrupt that pattern of. Uh, how communities get investments, uh, who it works for. I live, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, in West Chelsea. I do not think Hudson Yards was um, a, a tremendous benefit for our community. It's not contextual. It doesn't contribute to affordable housing. It contributes to displacement. Um, and I think we're seeing uh, the failures even in design uh, through this pandemic. How do you think Hudson Yards contributes to displacement? I'm curious. Well, if you look at the housing that it's created, it's all high and luxury housing. As a utility, as someone who spent her career in urban planning and different aspects of it, uh, we've created value that's essentially privatized a lot of that public space, even if you can walk into the, the mall, as we call it. Um, it's really not a welcoming place. I mean, not everyone is going to be shopping at um, one of these super high end uh, luxury uh, retail environments. And frankly, um, if even if it is a big success, in many ways, it takes away from street level retail and small businesses that we really want to be supporting through this crisis and beyond. Um, it's cut off uh, from from the rest of the fabric of the neighborhood in the city. And, you know, historically speaking, the building of it took advantage of um, you know, uh, funds that were to be used for um, areas that have been significantly underinvested in. And I think it's a great example of how our development works. It says, okay, we'll give you access to these state and federal and local programs and funds if you do the building for affordable housing. But that's not what real estate is incentive to do. Real estate in the private sector is incentive to make money. Uh, and I think uh, you, your original question is, what neighborhoods are ripe for, for development. I think the question is slightly different as I would pose it to myself, which is um, how do we get more affordable housing? Um, mm -hmm. My great colleague, my former great colleague, Parika Williams, who was assistant secretary of housing when I was at state, 
uh, and now is a housing advocate um, and leader, as, as you may know. Uh, and she talks a lot about um, development being something that happens to communities instead of something that they're a part of. And I think that's absolutely true for some of the power um, dynamics that I've explained. I think we should be approaching community-based response to the needs. I think every community, community board-wise, should be contributing more to uh, the affordable housing stock, deeply affordable housing stock, supportive housing stock. Um, and then I have one more point that I want to say on this, but our community should be leading it. I think there are examples of people trying to do that, like the Chinatown Working Group, for example, is mm -hmm. trying to come up with a different version of how we respond to our problems. Um, I will say, as an aside, I am not supportive of the speaker's approach to centralized um, okay. planning. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we don't need another Robert Moses in the city, certainly not now. Um, and I would be very averse to that. I have been very vocal on that. Yeah, well, I would love to talk more about the comprehensive planning point, but unfortunately, we don't have time. Um, a couple more things, though, I do want to get to while we're on the matter of land use. Um, do you support the the jail plan that's that's moving yeah. forward? Um, yeah. Go ahead. You're shaking your head. No, go ahead. Yeah, I don't. Um, I, in fact, I've been at numerous rallies mm -hmm. over the last, I would say, year or so um, against the borough-based jail plan. I think, um, as I have tremendous respect for the borough president, she was my first city councilwoman when I moved to New York. I do not agree with her stance and the stance of many city council members in support of this borough-based jail plan. Um, I actually, what do you think fact, should happen? I don't think, I think we can both close Rikers and use the existing borough-based jail stock that we have um, as as the criminal justice reform changes that we have undertaken have the impact that they should largely speaking we're going to have fewer and fewer people in the jail system we're already seeing that represented and the last thing we need to do is to create bifurcate already um uh, communities that we've already um, hurt in the planning process. And I have to say, we've really hurt our Chinatown community um, in a lot of ways. I actually just watched walked Chinatown this weekend with uh, important community stakeholders. And we looked at um, the existing um, jail and, and how the, in design, that was supposed to create all these tremendous public spaces for the community to interact with what is a difficult concept? You're bringing people um, in, in for booking and for, for jailing and the like. Um, now that what was supposed to be a public plaza is now a parking lot for, for cops. And um, I think we've really missed the boat in, in a lot of the um, ways that we've approached um, building um, and approached um, community connection. The last thing that young kids should see growing up is groups of people every hour being herded into the um, to mm. to the borough-based jail um, in Manhattan? And I and I talk to some community advocates who grew up that way, and I I do not think we should be investing. Oh, I have two more thoughts on this. I do not think we should be investing um, desperately needed capital in this project when we can. And I've talked to many advocates, uh, many planners. Who, who agree with me, and I agree with them, I didn't come up with this, I, we can close Rikers, which needs to close, without opening bur new borough-based jails. Um, the other thing I would just say that is, I think, a real reflection of one of our problems, um, and has been a lifelong journey for me, is what do we do? What, what, let's look at what happened and who was prioritized when we came up with these borough-based jails. First, we ignored the community where it would be built. Uh, we ignored their desires and their engagement. And we basically designed a system where the women who were gonna be moving from Rikers would still be placed far away predominantly in um, more um, uh, further away area of Queens, right? So mm -hmm. the whole argument here had been, let's create a more humane system in buildings where people can get better access to their lawyers and their family members and the like. Oh, but what did we do? We put the women even further away in Queens. Um, and, and I think that that is um, symptomatic and emblematic of a lot of how our investment and our planning and our power has worked in the city. It's been not just to the disadvantage of, of communities of color, but also to women. And uh, that has to end. Okay. Well, there's a lot more we could discuss on the Manhattan Borough President powers and responsibilities in your campaign. We're unfortunately in our last four minutes here, and, and you and I discussed um, before uh, before coming on air here that, um, you know, we needed to spend a couple of minutes in this conversation uh, since we are talking with you about your campaign separately on um, allegations you've made against Governor Cuomo of sexual harassment and beyond, including um, an 
wanted kiss. Uh, you've you've posted um, some evidence even of some of the contact between his office and yourself. The governor's office has has denied your allegation. So I wanted to ask you here in our couple minutes on this is, um, do you have anything you know you want to say on the subject, uh, given how public the conversation has gotten and the governor's office uh, denial of your allegations? One and two, sort of what you want to see uh, happen from here. For someone who worked so hard their whole lives to be taken seriously and do very important work, the last thing in my life I wanted was to have this be something that people know me for. Um, but it was just too important. This is just too important to um, holding people and power accountable to changing for whom power works, including women. And um, if I didn't speak up, how were, especially women who are younger than I, who don't have um, the privilege of a platform that I do, ever gonna get out of this vicious cycle. And it's far too common and it needs to end. Um, and so when I hear uh, the governor and his team lie, which they do, about the reality of his abuse of power, I think it's really sad. Um, because it's a betrayal of the public's trust beyond the people that he abused and that his team supported the abuse of. I think it's incredibly sad. Um, as, a, as a progressive, and I really believe um, in progressive values, I'm not focused on punishment. I'm focused on accountability. And we do not have accountability when the governor of this state um, preys on women, mostly younger than myself, and then lies about it. If he can abuse his power in that way, how is he abusing his power over every New Yorker? Abuse doesn't restrict itself to one realm. It goes far beyond that. And so um, I didn't want this fight. I didn't choose this fight. It's the last fight I wanted to have my career and my name be about, but I will take it on because it's unjust and it represents a broader system that has kept so many women where they are and that has to change. I'm raising a daughter and I refuse to see the future look like mine has looked for her. And lastly, just as we're speaking, the attorney sure. general uh, has been given the power to conduct an investigation, has hired sure. uh, attorneys to do it. Um, are you participating in that? Do you feel comfortable in the direction that the investigation is heading? Yes, I'm participating fully um, as will um, my legal team. And uh, I, I welcome that process. I think the attorney general is someone of integrity. And as I understand it, the folks that she has appointed um, to the investigation are people who um, are people of integrity. And uh, I welcome this process. Okay. Lindsay Boylan, thank you for the time. Uh, Lindsay Boylan is a candidate, a Democratic candidate for Manhattan Borough president. And uh, we will talk with you in the future as the campaign unfolds. Thank you so much, Ben. I really appreciate it. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in the June primaries and fall general election. There's a lot on the line for all of us in the future of New York City. I hope this conversation and others are helpful to you as you make your choices. Until next time, I'm Ben Max. Goodbye. <music>